Well, we go straight to the papers this morning. Is on The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. I am Messi Bopo, and thanks for joining us. Uh, we set off with the Daily Independent has been made available by a paper vendor. Quite interesting headlines, if you ask me. The banner caption says, Despite Buhari's charge to Adamu, Asu vows not to back down. <laughs> uh, it's going to be very dramatic. Accuses Ngige of double standards and denies breakaway faction. That's a writer underneath the board caption, six month old strike. But the president has given uh, a direction. Some people would say that the president should not be leading from behind. The president should be in front and acting and not giving instructions. Uh, we hope Mr. President is listening. Government and security agencies have failed to secure Nigerians. Masari is quoted. And underneath, Katsina residents in fear over increased activities of bandits. Malabu... Italian prosecutors abandoned $1.3 billion appeal against any and shell. Nigeria continues $3.5 billion claim against all firms. Still looking at the Daily Independent, uh, you have no interesting headlines here. Will continue key rate hike if inflation persists? That's what the Central Bank of Nigeria is quoted to say. And some people have accused, you know, Godwin and Mephili saying that, how do you begin to print money? Because printing money does not solve the problem. Are we adding value? Are we earning what, we're, what we have? You know, the morning circulation. I picked Shatima as running mate for a common good, a former Lagos state governor and also the flag bearer of the APC, uh, presidential flag bearer is quoted to say, Alleged money laundering, AFCC asked me to indict Jonathan Adoke, witness tells court. Dangote Industries complete insurance of uh, 187.6 billion naira. Series I fixed rate senior unsecured bond. And another caption here, boldly written, says new NMPC will guarantee national energy security. That's the gold, and that's what the president is saying. Uh, underneath, says firm now commercially driven independent oil company. To grow retail outlets from 547 to 1,500 in six months. This is what uh, Mela Carey has quoted to say. 18 state raked or rank poorly on health system indicators. 18 state rank poorly on health system indicators. Uh, some of the headlines you find this morning on the Daily Independent newspaper. We move away from the Daily Independent, and that's because we have the Guardian in front of us. Let's quickly run through the pages, uh, front pages. High, low expectation as Buhari unveils the new NNPC. Underneath, we will end energy poverty losses, says Carrie, why NNPC may remain a uh, loss-making company despite transition or transitioning. That's what experts are quoted to say. I mean, why, why are we so skeptical about all of this? Uh, redundant staff, political will, hash, environmental clouds, uh, Buhari and stakeholders' expectations. Transitioning, a man name change, says... Uh, a stakeholder, former LCCI boss, insists a new Amacron may image. Uh, that's the company in Saudi Arabia. Adain Sawyer is saying that subsidy and liabilities, frontier ex exploration may impact cash flow. OPS backs hike as oil marketers comply with NMPC directives and raise a uh, petrol price to 179 naira per litre, it differs in different parts of the Federation. Local airlines six or sick 40% fuel short charge and weavers as Jet A1 hits 822 litre naira per litre. Asu knocks Buhari for ordering minister to end varsity strikes in two weeks. Gunmen kidnap uh, a college farmer and supervisor on a Bumo show and demand 100 million naira as ransom. You also have uproar over killing of 14 emo youths in Awo. 
a community and a local government in Imo State. That's also very worrisome. Uh, some persons are saying that there need to be a thorough investigation, especially when you have the governor of Imo State, Hopo uh, Uzo Dema, uh, saying that the killings were not done by uh, the security architecture or regional Ibuwe Agu, but rather it was done by the police uh, DSS. That's a serious one. It should be investigated. But of course, uh, you know, those who should investigate it are also the persons who have been accused. Just imagine. Think about what becomes of the outcome. But should we doubt what, you know, the governor of Imo State has mentioned or has talked about because he's the chief security officer of his state and he has access to a lot of intelligence. So, uh, really saddening. You need to see the videos and the pictures. Very, very, very saddening. What exactly is going on? Uh, away from that, NMPC unveils. I beg your pardon. I feels like NMPC might just be dominating our thoughts this morning. APC unveils Shatima as Tunubu's running mate despite opposition. And another caption says the NMA laments mass exodus of doctors and health workers from Ondo State. Where are they moving to? That's another question. Uh, but that's it on the Guardian newspaper. Oyetola pencils 50 lawyers, APC, a delicate trade words. Oyetola pencils 50 lawyers, talking about the Oshun Pole uh, Tribunal. Uh, don't forget that shortly after the result was actually announced, uh, Oyetola has said that he's studying the result, and now reports are saying that uh, 50 lawyers have been penciled. But underneath Oyetola's legal team to consist of 50 lawyers or more, that's a rider, senior advocate is quoted to say, don't tamper with election materials to favor APC at Delicate Ones, INEC. You are only afraid of your shadow, APC berates governor elect Adelike, apparently. So there's a back and forth with the, th with the two. Uh, stubborn Asu says federal government must meet all demands. I mean, how the punch captions it this morning is very interesting. Stubborn Asu says federal government must meet all demands. And to even think that this agreement, I mean, this is uh, some sort of agreement that was entered, both parties entered this agreement. Yeah, some years back. I mean, it's a long time. Uh, why are we still talking about this agreement and implementation of the agreement? And before you get into an agreement, they always say uh, an agreement is an agreement. You should respect it because it, it feels like two people have come to a point where hey, we have agreed on something. There's some level of compromise. And the other party is saying, I will do X, Y, Z. It's just a matter of integrity. Uh, away from that, Muslim, Muslim ticket. A double year back scan, PFN APC unveils Shatima today. Italy drops $3.5 billion. Any and shell suit, Nigeria presses on. And outcry CBN raises the benchmark interest rate again. Confusion as 179 naira per liter fuel prices uh, controversy worsens. That's still on the punch, and Buhari unveils the NNPC Limited Agency, halts the FAAC remittances, or remittance. Uh, it's, it's really going to be a lot. What happens to the states? What becomes of the uh, different states now? Because usually the practice is that everyone would go to, you know, uh, to the state capital to get their own share. And now that there would be no remittance, uh, what becomes of the state? How do they sustain the economy? Maybe gradually we're moving to restructuring the economy. How Nigeria can make vaccines? Okonjo Iwela is quoted. And uh, Lagos policeman on illegal duty handcuff brutalized. It's more like an editorial. Families mass up demand justice for slain Imo youths. Another caption talks about scholarship, federal government defaults, PhD scholars stranded. Wow, very, very saddening. Panic as Lagos fuel tankers explode and destroy vehicles. And federal government alerts ports and land borders over uh, Marburg virus. That's, that's very strange, but we need to pay attention. That's it on the punch. And just before we have our guests join us this morning, we have uh, the Nation newspaper. The Nation reporting uh, not differently from all the papers this morning. It talks about ASU, 
Buhari orders Ngige to hand off negotiation. Oh, that's great. Uh, education minister gets 14 days to resolve crisis. One million naira monthly pay likely for professors. This would probably just be, uh, you know, a fantastic. Can you imagine that professors of universities, I mean, this call is great. We have, well, I'm sure that, you know, we've all gone through uh, the university, especially, you know, having to be lectured. This person's don't end, um, I mean, what the end is about 500,000 naira. That's what the professor ends in Nigeria. Does that, is that very exciting? Does, the, does it make the educational sector very attractive? Why would people not want to become politicians, you know, become governors, become councillors and chairmen of different local government? Because it feels like that pays more than education. Well, it would be really great to see that professors uh, will be earning more, not so much, but it would be better, you know, than 500,000 naira. ASU government does not need two weeks to end strike. Sano warns against disparity in salaries. Now, don't forget that the NLC is also still saying that we are going to be embarking on a warning strike, a solidarity, solidarity strike between uh, the 26th of July and the 27th, uh, just to ensure that you know, the government gets to uh, swings to action. Massary rates government agencies low on security. Plans on the way to reposition NDDC, says Umana, and 57% of electricity consumers on estimated billing. Vice President Osibajo recovering fast, says hospital, uh, the hospital right here, because 100% pay rise likely for striking varsity teachers. It will be great. NNPC shifts subsidy payments burden to government. And... Uh, Tunubu picked Shatima for public good. These are the headlines you find this morning. But just before we move away, the Central Bank of Nigeria to sanction consumers or customers converting Naira to dollar. Mm. Interest rate up by 1%. We have Tunde Kolawale, who is a legal practitioner. He joins uh, the conversation this morning. Tunde Kolawale, thank you so much for making our time to be part of uh, the breakfast. Good morning, the domestic. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining as well. Uh, but we just quickly take a break. Tunde Kolawali, when we return, we'll be sharing your thoughts on some of the big stories on our papers this morning. Please stay with us. Well, we're still on the breakfast, and as off the press, we uh, have uh, Ezekiel Yai to Kentunde Kolawali joining the conversation. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen, for being part of the show. Thanks for having us. All right. I start off with um, Tunde Kolawali. Do we still have you via phone? Uh -huh. All right. Um, let's start with the Are daily. Yes, we can hear you now. So um, on the Daily Independent, it talks about the strike. I'm sure that you're in the know of the directive that the president had given to the minister uh, of education, asking that the strike should end, you know, they should put an end to the strike. But on the other hand, as we're saying, they're not going to back off until the government, um, you know, gets into the agreement. I mean, implements the agreement that they had prior to this time. Uh, is that for me? Yes, that's for you. All right. Well, uh, my position yes. on the answer site is uh, very straightforward and very clear. I wrote a very long article in the nation newspaper not too long ago. For now, I think this answer matter to be resolved. My take is that um, what answer is asking for under the present regime or any other regime for that matter, is not realistic. So I have advised also that it should consider the energy on ensuring that we have good governance in the country. And until we have good governance, it is going to be well nigh impossible for all sectors of our life to be properly funded, adequately funded, and properly managed. 
If you go to our hospitals, if you look at the state of our infrastructural uh, uh, development, if you go to PSPN, and most of these other public places, which one of them can you say is properly funded? So, I don't think it is feasible, I don't think it is realistic to have a no issue of a properly funded institution like the university when all the other areas of our life are run down and are not properly funded. Furthermore, the way and manner schools and universities used to be run in the past can never be done in the present times again. The scenario has changed. We have more universities, more polytechnics, more colleges of education, and more children going to school these days. So how should we have to see that with the government? And because they have to have the expertise, we need to, be, to develop a new funding and model for all the schools in Nigeria. All this insistence that companies should be paying educational tax levy, this one should be doing this, this one should be doing that, I just want to be understood. Companies are set up not to fund solar schools, but to provide dividends to provide profit for those who partner the establishment. So when you load the company in Nigeria with the sole responsibility of funding education, what you are simply doing is killing those establishments too, in the sense that if people can no longer take dividends and profit of this company, they will not invest in them again. And so the company too will run down. So they have to people to please, in the name of God, bury the asset of this child, sit down with the government, evolve a new funding model for our schools, and then drop this idea okay. of uh, trying to make the university a noises of opulence, a noises of a proper funding, and then an area in which the people working there will live above the rest of the society. Judges are asking for special funds. University professors are asking for special funds. And to retire at the age of 70, what about the nurses? What about the teachers? Are they not also entitled to, to the good things of life? Are they not entitled to their comfort? All right. Tune so the color, have... Wale. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let's, let's bring in Ezekiel and Yai took down. But not on the right. issue of, uh, you know, as you backing down as regards uh, the charge, because as we're saying that they're not going to back down until uh, their demands are being met. And so it's, it's, it's not like uh, the, there will be a difference with the order that the president has given to the Minister of Education. Not also um, neglecting the fact that Chris Ngege seemed to not be the one negotiating now with ASU. But um, Ezekiel Yai, took, let's talk about the new NMPC. It will be the crux of our conversation. I mean, Nigerians have been talking. There's been a lot of high and low expectations. Some people are optimistic, others are pessimistic as regards uh, the unveiling of the new NMPC. But what are your thoughts now? The president says that uh, the new NMPC will guarantee national energy security. Do you think that this would be the case? Uh, I, I'll tell you, there are two things about the Nigerian state. We have some of the best policies. We have some of the best, you know, um, structures and systems by right. But the problem is when you get an, a, an aeronautical engineer to pilot an aircraft, you discover that you are getting a right guy to the wrong job. So our recruitment processes is what damages our best policies. That's what really brings about the highs and the lows because the unbundling of the NFPC and giving it this private sector, you know, coloration by right in terms of policy, in terms of um, direction is exciting. But the question is, who are the people that are being brought in to manage this process? So long as the people are square pegs in round holes, you cannot expect any results that is meaningful. 
that is where we always get it wrong. We over politicize everything that we do. We are, it, it's the concept of pre bendalism and, and clannishness and tribalism, of exalting that above excellence and fit for purpose. So I think that at the end of the day, it's um, something that um, we hope that we will have a government or a system that will one day subscribe to the concept of uh, meritocracy. Once we do that, if the right people are moved into this vehicle, this new NNPC bundles, then we will hope to have results. But where you don't have the right people that are moved into this vehicle, it's going to be same old, same old. That's my approach. That's where optimism is being doused with um, pessimism because of um, the recruitment process. Mm. Well, um, Tunde Kolawale, what are your thoughts on it? Do you think differently? Well, for the PHN. For the Hello? NMPC, the new NMPC. Well, okay. For are you optimistic NMPC. about it? No, I'm not. I am not. First and foremost, by now, Messi should have uh, known my position. I have <laughs> told well, I can't you tell. petroleum products with the uh, um, uh, what call for the NNPC. I also let I say all over the world today, nobody is talking about petroleum products. Nobody is talking about their own NNPC. People are exploring alternative energy. The wind, the sun, and then um, uh, ocean wave, hydro energy, and uh, wind mist and water. So for Nigeria to so see the happen on uh, NNPC and on um, and then petroleum products and all that, tells me that the Nigerian leaders are not uh, have, I mean, they don't uh, have the right vision. They are not preparing for the future. Sooner than later, the petroleum product will be like coal. And nobody wants to use it. It is not full of energy. But with that as it may, all the unbundling, all the reform that they have carried out in the past on NNPC and in the petroleum sector, which one of them has ever worked, even to the best of my knowledge, we spent trillions of naira trying to refurbish the refinery. We have unbundled and unbundled and bundled the NNPC. What are we got it for? The truth of the matter is that those who make billions of naira when we put the span of NMPC, they are still around. And the political will is never there to deal decisively with these people. So long the political will is there, and the merchants of Venice, who are reaping bountiful assets from the petroleum sector, are still around, I am not optimistic that anything can be done in that area. Not if it is going to be done, if we be under this regime. Hmm. All right, then, uh, as I can, yeah, I took hmm. on the Punch newspaper. Uh, it's about the Oshun elections. And the question is that how long will we continue with this, uh, you know, election tribunal kind of election where we constantly have to go to courts and uh, seek redress because we feel that our rights have been violated? Do you see a repeat of 2018 in 2022 for Shun State? I, I think it is one mistake that APC government dare not make. But at this point in time, let me not talk about APC government. Let's talk of the judiciary. I think the judiciary, as at this point in time, need to be extremely careful. This is one of the few elections. Well, let me not say. This is one, one election that is being adjudged as one of the freest, fairest it, across the nation, generally. So, two things. The first is that if the APC government has been told by the people that they should leave, the very least they could do is to live in honor and not to think in terms of wasting more of the resources of the people on a fruitless journey. Because if their intention is to get in to manipulate the judiciary, 
two things happen. The very first is that the judiciary will bring itself to repute, and I believe better things of them, that it will not happen. The second is that they are, I'm hearing the news of, you know, lining up 50, you know, um, sands. I want us to know the cost of each sand, which is not child's play. Now this is going to be the people's money. The governor could do well to exit on a blade of glory by using the money he's got to attack one or two areas that is important to the people of Washington State and not to go on this, this, this bridge that leads to nowhere. I think that people need to be enlightened on the cost of this so-called you know, tribunal or whatever they want to do. Mr. President has congratulated the person. And above that, the generality of Nigerians listen to all the news commentaries. They're like, wow, INEC, they've even gone ahead to, to commend INEC. So why does the state government still think that it should add salt to injury by wanting to use more of the resources? Each senior advocate is going, unless he wants to tell me that all the people are coming in pro bono because they believe that there is injustice somewhere along the line. I think that he's got a lot of work. The best he can do is to be a sportsman, accept the result, give pray, um, um, congratulatory message to the winner, and then the remaining few days, by the heart of the people, by being extremely corporate and being very judicious with the spending of the people's money. Don't try to move away with the resources of the people or the properties of the people or whatever structures that will make the transition difficult. That will make people to hate, add hate to rejection, and he will not like it. I think those who know him should advise the governor better and tell him to just be a sportsman. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. He can always recruit and come back, and that is going to do by buying the heart of the people, you know, from the time he leaves office. He's seen so many people who have lost and come back. So that his loss does not mean he cannot come back. Wow. Well, Tunde Kola Wale, you're a legal practitioner. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, do you think that there were my, irregularities with the elections my, in Oshun State that were My position is going to be slightly different from that of my colleague. So in the sense that we as lawyers, we don't discourage people from going to court for two reasons. One, we don't encourage people to engage in self help. When you stop people, when you frustrate them, when you put a bar on the accessing the facilities of the court, what you are indirectly encouraging them to do is to engage in self help. And when people engage in self help, anarchy will set in and law and order will break down. And no society profits on the breakdown of law and order. The second one is uh, this may appear to be a little bit selfish, but I would consider this to be a kind of an indicted certain trend. It is in times like this that we lawyers make a lot of money by representing people in some of those uh, tribunals. So for those lawyers that might be hired to institute a uh, case at the tribunal, on behalf of the problem for two states, what we might be doing is blocking them from uh, any they are living as lawyers. And if lawyers don't go to court and if they don't go to the tribunal to litigate, where will their sources of income come from? Is it from selling rice and beans or potatoes? The answer is no. The second one is that I think what we should be encouraging or what we should be telling the judiciary is that when people approach the court, they should send them and do justice. Not allow the kind of thing that happened in the Rizzo Zimmer case, in Nemo case, case, to happen again. Because if each time people lose election, they go to the tribunal, and the tribunal gives the election that they bring it to them and take it away from the ordinary voters on the street, we are in a way undermining the democracy. And when we undermine our democracy, People will become disenchanted. People will lose interest. People will 
have a party. And democracy doesn't go that way. We want the democracy to go. We want it to be sustainable. We want uh, people to be able to drive the dividend, the dividend of democracy the way it could be driven or it could be done in question in some other part of the world. So they took uh, graduation in those two states. For me, the people have spoken, but if anybody has grievances and you think the grievance are the new and you want to ventilate the grievance at the tribunal, I don't think there should be anything uh, wrong with that. It is the judiciary that will be reminded. Don't allow the politician to persecute the temple of justice. Don't allow the politician to corrupt the judiciary. Our judiciary, as of today, appears to be a lot and a whole lot uh, politicized. And when the judiciary is politicized, it's not a lot of danger for the society as a whole. Look at what happened in the Supreme Court through the temple. And we some Supreme Court wrote a petition against uh, the CJN. Now to look at what happened in the two states. When Mr. Alvarez Venezuela was there, in which a sitting judge had to write a petition, and then the, man, the woman was made up back on non payment of salaries in the two states. All these things are debating the judiciary. Well, Tunde Kalawale, it's it's a good thing that you have mentioned. Uh, it's a good thing that you've mentioned that uh, for every time we constantly approach the court or the tribunals uh, for uh, the elections, then we constantly undermine our democracy. That's what it is because it, it just constantly make nonsense of the fact that people go to cast their votes and in a, in a system and a time where you know the judicial process or the judicial system is in the works. I mean, people think it's work in progress. In our democracy, trust is not so much uh, you know, on the judiciary to deliver justice to the people as at this time, in all cases. But um, uh, Ezekiel Nyaituk is also um, waiting to say something, then uh, go ahead. Yes, um, yeah, it, it, it's very important that we note this. In every profession, there is what the demands of morality ethic. As much as you need to have the boys having work to do, we have an election. You know, you know that it's relatively free and fair. You don't want the society to generate into an I agree where there is a possibility of that. In Osho election, after the announcement, you could see that there was a general acceptance as this being free, fair, credible. So there's no element of that of anarchy. Secondly, the payment of your fee is going to come from the public till. And this is a state where the debt profile is so high. Why can't we say, yeah, yeah, but let this pass? I think that there should be a moral burden on the conscience of the lawyers to advise them and say, look, I would like to take this brief, but I think that it is against the interest of the public except I'm willing to do it pro bono. But if I'm going to charge the normal legal fees on a case that I know the end from the beginning, I think there's a moral burden on the conscience of the lawyers relative to the people whose money would have been spent that would have been used for their, maybe the retirees or the pensioners or even the students on bursaries or the healthcare facilities, or the housing, there are so many other areas that this money could have been better deployed. That's just my honest opinion. All right, and quickly, uh, let's also look at this. Uh, it talks about the confusion as you have a petrol being sold at 179 naira per liter, and the price controversy continues because the price, there's no constant or there's no consistent uh, price across the entire country. And so 
in some parts of the country, for instance, in Lagos, it could be sold at 169, 170, depending on the fueling station. And in other parts, in Abuja, it could be sold for 180 or 190. And so there's, there's a lot of price disparity. There's no fixed and uniform price. What, what do you make of the stress? Who's? Your, your time now. <laughs> Is it going out? Okay. Okay. Um, there's something called petroleum equalization. And it's very easy to understand. A product in Lagos, sold in Lagos, has two components or three. It has a component of the cost of the product. It has a component of the overhead of the product. And it has a component of the profit of the, of, the, of the product. Now, the first and the last, the price and the profit is constant. But the overhead is related to the distance. Something that you bring into Lagos port and you sell in Lagos, the cost element might be, say, one naira relative to all the dynamics. But that same product, if you are taking it to Kano or Kaduna or Zamfara or Akwaibom, your transportation cost cannot be the same as that of Lagos. As a result, it is either you impute it on the overhead or final cost of the product, or there is what you call an equalization or a subsidy of some sort or a takeoff of that element. So, so long as it's left to market forces, the prices of petroleum is going to be less in Lagos than in Kano, while the, price, the cost of beef that is brought from Kano to Uyo is going to be less in, Uyo, in, in, in Kano than in Uyo. I think that's just the way it is. The only is a social service or intervention. The government can get into a strategic understanding with rest. That's why they had the period petroleum equalization, you know, um, agency or set up that they have. But you see, all these have been, been wrapped in mysteries that just don't make sense. What is the exact landing cost of petroleum in this country? That's number one. Number two, what is the honest cost? Can we get the professionals get in to give us the honest? Our figures, of, our data is so 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 warped and so uncoordinated and so unreliable that what you have is fraud, corruption, fraud. All right, um, uh, ju just uh, I share Tunde Kolawale's thoughts in just a second, as we call it of now. Tunde Kolawale, what would be your thoughts yeah. on this? The disparity and the controversy surrounding the uh, pump prices across the Federation. Well, well I am not uh, an economist like my, <laughs> like my colleague. Uh, who has done an economic analysis of uh, the price of 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 what happened to what we have to go now. Thank you so much. We, we seem not to have a All smooth right. conversation uh, with you at the time, uh, but we appreciate you and we really thank you for making our time to be part of the show. Uh, thank you so much, Ezekiel and Yaitouk, as well. We appreciate you uh, for being with us on short notice. Thanks for having us. And that's the size of it on Off the Press. We take a break and when we return, we'll be heading straight to our very first major conversation where we look at the new NNPC that's been unveiled by the president. Stay with us. <laughs>